Okay, so, um, you know, that was actually a really hard film. <laughs> and um, it's one of, the th one of the things the show is about is sometimes when you watch something that's that dense or complicated, it's really nice to be in a room together with people uh, talking about it. And so I'm really actually looking forward to hearing what you thought about when you watched um, the film. Um, and um, I guess I'll start out because we, most of the people in the room today are my students in Intro to Video, and we just watched um, Vertical Roll by Joan Jonas uh, right before we came here. And I was sort of thinking a lot about that film when I was watching this. Uh, in one sense, I'll begin with, which was the focus on the eye and the eye in the circle, and then the focus on circles in the film, which made me think a lot about the film being about seeing and the sort of mechanisms of seeing and film as producing um, frames, which we had just talked about in class. I'm wondering if anybody wanted to thought, uh, talk about the circles and um, the eye um, as, a, as a beginning um, way to think about filmmaking um, and, and, and seeing. Um, yeah, I guess it just, it, I found it similar to the one we just watched as well because the way they do the focus, it's kind of like a spotlight. So they really control what you see, not only what you see, but what you focus on. Because there's, there's other stuff around this. Like in the last one, it was just like one thing you could look at. But this one was kind of like your eye could explore a little bit, but then it was brought back to that center point with the circle. You were working a floodlight this summer, right? I mean, so what do you think about using light and a circle in relationship, in relationship to dance performance? I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Would you like to talk about the way in which that focuses our attention, even as the um, visual field is so distracting? Or do you not want to do that? OK. Other thoughts about the circle and about focus and about framing in this piece? And why the frame is a circle in this sense? Where, uh, in this piece, whereas in Joan, Joan Jonas's piece, it's very, very rectangular, you know. So how does that make us think? What does the circle bring up for you as a framing device? Um, one and two. Yeah. Uh, um, well, part of the circle thing kind of symbolizes time and the way that it was used going clockwise and counterclockwise kind of gave the piece uh, like a historical motion. Uh, just to touch on the whole vignette as a follow spot uh, light, uh, when using a spot, there's uh, in dance, usually you have your principal, which is who you're picking up, and you'll have everyone else. And everyone else kind of creates this chorus of dancing, which uh, really backs up your, your principal. And so the vignette that was used in this video to highlight certain things kind of does that as there's all these objects that create kind of a chorus of background while we have this focus point that we have. It seems to me like if you think about the spotlight as telling us who the main character is, you know, it's that weird strange girl doll thing, right? She's sort of the main character, but there are other main characters that end up inside the circle. So like the Robin Head is often there. Um, time, as you're right, so time becomes a, you know becomes a subject once it sort of shows up inside the circle. Um, so she's sort of, even though it's not narrative, she's giving us these little like clues about what a narrative might be. Did anybody find a story in there? And if not, why is she not making stories? Um, as we were told by James prior to the videos about education and what. What we see is this doll, which is this girl, traveling through sets of stories. And it's like, first there's history, and we see images of war scenes, just pictures through the Robin Heads, where the Robin Heads were. And then we see images of anatomy, which is her essentially learning biology, in my opinion, like, to me. Um, and then it just continues with these different images, and then the red that comes in is kind of felt like to me the overload of information that one has kind of towards the end of a year when you've just absorbed so much information that it's just all has to be released and just all this stress and just kind of go nuts. <laughs> different from me, but 
but like I'm really grateful to have heard that. I think when we were talking about earlier, the theme was like I think it was entertainment and education, and how like um, like pages. I don't know if it was like a war document with like some war drawings and like um, some what's it, ornithology for bird studies, whatever. Um, and so it seemed like it was like making it into like this sort of like action movie where like the bird like things that are dying and I guess it was sort of like taking the like boring educational material and turning it into like this like fantasy Hollywood movie where people die and there's blood everywhere. Um, and so that's why that's why I saw the connection between art and art, education and entertainment. But it was that sort of like um, artsy like ambiguity craziness that I think that like bothers me about a lot of video or a lot of like like tree carton like crazy video stuff. Um, so that, that makes it very, very difficult to like try to grasp it because it's like a whole lot of stuff going on. Um, but I saw the art entertainment and sort of like blood everywhere. I had the advantage of watching it twice. Um, but the second time, the first time around, I noticed purely the like the what you mentioned, the fetish, fetishization of the iris and how the eye is represented throughout the whole narrative as being we're we're seeing things through a keyhole or through a lens of an eye that is almost Freudian. We see her behind screens that have holes in it several times. So the question is then. The two characters that I identify as like the main characters that, uh, as an audience member, you can identify with is either the dis-skinned human who has separate pieces of himself running throughout the narrative, or the girl, and it's his eye we see at the beginning, and then it's her we see behind a screen looking through holes, and so we always are then purported through a hole through the rest of the film. But then the second time I watched it, I saw through the sound codifications uh, a re really narrative of, a frame narrative of she, because the piece is called Ghost Algebra. And so the idea of somehow she's out removed or uh, has a narrative as a character and then it's telling her story. And we see, uh, for me at least, it was her in the afterlife or some some ethereal plane and then we see the second the second uh large sound that we're seeing is children playing and we see her playing and that's the first time we see her clearly not silhouetted and we see her going down a slide we see her with a ferris wheel type structure in the back we see her sitting on a rock and those are very clear images and then we see her fall off the rock as the sound turns from the playful children on the playground to a more screaming children on the playground. And then the next sound is uh, changed. It goes silent. And then we have that Disney-esque pan through the trees and then the mirror pond type of representation that it begins with, which to me was the symbolization of this frame narrative between the two of that's the story of her. And now we're going to see more of the ethereal plane. And then the rest of it is seeing into people. We start for the first time seeing into holes of seeing into the birds, seeing behind the birds, seeing uh, behind the human and the skin. And so for me, it was the representation of being able to see through a keyhole into maybe another, another life, another time. Well, I, I really appreciate the fact that you um, put in this Freudian interpretation and into this idea of looking because one of the things we didn't talk about in relationship to Joan Jonas and it's relevant in both pieces is that who, who is being looked at, who is looking, and who is the artist in both cases is a woman. So in Joan Jonas's vertical role, you are only looking at the body of a woman, right? And in this piece, you're looking at a protagonist who is a strange little girl doll. And there's certainly something being said about how men look at women, how women are looked at, and, but that is being controlled through the vision of a female artist. And I'm wondering if anyone wants to think a little bit more about um, that in relationship to either of the things that we saw today, about a female artist thinking about the ways that women are seen um, typically in Hollywood films, typically in television, and then they make their own art to be seen differently. So any thoughts about gender and looking maybe to end this one? 
someone we haven't heard from? Thierry, I'll come back to you. Would anyone else like to comment on that? I mean, this film is very violent, really. There's a real kind of ominous quality to um, how she's being seen, I think, and um, not so true in, in vertical role. Um, as, so when I first saw the title, I thought it reminded me of Interior Scroll, where the artist pulls a poem out of her vagina about... Yeah, I saw that. Um, and so it reminded me of that feminist piece, but then... That's like Charlotte Sheen. Charlotte Sheen, yeah. And um, I think, I don't know if all the images of, in the, in, of the, like, um, vertical role was sexual, but there was the belly dancer, and that sort of like long, sexy scene. Um, so that reminded me of that, but it didn't, I, I couldn't like form like a, a political like, you know, conclusion when I saw that. And with this one, and thinking about Hollywood movies and how like we use like little girls as like the like objects of like fear a lot. Um, but I didn't like, I don't, I don't know like, if, if there's a sort of like culture of like men looking at women that are very, very young except for like child pornography or something like that. But um, I know when, when talking about gender and looking, it's a, very often talks about sexuality. Um, and this one didn't seem particularly sexualized. No. So I, I, I wouldn't, I mean, I, I, could, I didn't come to any conclusions I about that. I agree with you. I agree with you. In fact, quite the opposite, right? It's, it's hardly, there's, it, she's hardly sexualized at all. Then again, she's some kind of plastic or wax doll. It's a little bit hard to sexualize her. That said, it's quite easy to sexualize anything if you're making films. So the artist has to work very hard not to sexualize her, actually, right? Um, did you want to say something more? Anyone else? OK, let me end. We'll just sort of leave that to our YouTube audience. Um, by an earlier comment about video art that someone made um, and why people make things that are this abstract, and sort of, as they say, dense, and open to interpretation, and very much about feeling. And I'm wondering if anyone wants to comment on the complexity of the piece. Somebody said, well, that's why I don't like video art. That's why I don't like experimental film. That was you theory. I'm wondering if anyone likes it for that reason, and wants to talk about the experience of seeing something that is not completely forthcoming, that doesn't deliver everything you need to know about it in one second, which is what media is like today which leaves, it leaves you open to interpretation, allows you to be inside of a, a set of ex feelings more than knowing something. Anybody like that um, experimental film, video art kind of thing? Yeah. Well, I think one thing that's important about um, experimental film or video art and uh, is what they're, they're breaking from what, a narrative expectation or even visual expectation is just that, that it allows you to see. I mean, it's something as basic as the sort of like superimpositions of layers here, um, the play with um, the, uh, the birds and their heads and basically like some, some very, some things that were very basically just sort of visually appealing um, that didn't necessarily make sense. Uh, if you're not looking for sense to be made, uh, I think you can, and even if you are, you grasp a lot from just seeing, from visual play. And so experimental film and video art allow people, allow filmmakers to do things visually, um, to basically work in different aesthetics and do different tricks that you'd have to work really hard to fit into a basic traditional narrative. Um, there are things that you want to see that can't be told in a sort of stereotypical storytelling manner. So. That's one reason that it's important to have. I appreciate your comments so much, and we'll end with them. And that's, you know, a lot of you, so I'm a teacher in this set, in a setting, I, this is my class, and a lot of why we teach you guys this experimental film and video, even though there's a certain amount of resistance to it, and even though a number of you will go on to work in traditional industries, is because um, it allows you to, to kind of experience the full range of the expressive capabilities of these media even if you end up using, making bad web stories with them or whatever, that the pleasure that we get from color, the, the pleasure we get from shapes, the kinds of visual pleasure, the auditory pleasure, and not just pleasure, complexity that's available in this expressive, these expressive tools, you know, I want you to know them all. Even then, you, if you're not allowed to use them, they're there in the back of your mind and they're um, influencing what you see, how you think, and what you will make. Um, so thank you all very much for participating in our conversation today, and we have coffee and tea over there if you guys want to take a break and some water, and then I'll take you downstairs to the basement as the next step of our tour. Okay.